to my good friend, business partner, and Ken co-founder, Peter Bryant. So I've got a uh, very short segment uh, today is to uh, introduce the next speaker. So uh, as you know, at Ken, uh, we kind of embrace two things amongst many. One is we love to embrace people and hear stories from people that really tackle intractable challenges that we face as a society and have a real impact. And you'll see in our community and the diversity that we have, we often bring in what we consider really deep thinkers from the military. And you know, Rob talked about this morning, Admiral James Tavridis. Uh, we had Lieutenant General Bradley Heithold, who was our second in command for US Special Forces uh, three years ago. So Jake Harriman, our next speaker, uh, embodies both those principles. I met Jake actually two years ago when he spoke at my daughter's uh, school. Uh, and over, over subsequent two years, I've got to know him very well. Uh, as you will see from his bio, he has served our country uh, in the US Marine Corps and US Special Forces uh, with distinction. Um, his story uh, through that is that he's going to share with us today, I have found not only very inspiring, but actually very insightful. And I'm not going to tell you about the story, but uh, during his service, he got, developed a sense of foresight and some deep insights around a real problem uh, that we face. And but did that under extreme and adverse conditions so that no one could actually imagine. So it wasn't based in data, it was based in human experience. Um, so, and then after he left the service in 08, he developed those insights, turned it into action, and to, into finally impact. So uh, we're really thrilled to be able to have uh, Jake join us and share our story today. So please uh, give a warm, kind welcome to Jake Harriman. Thank you so much. It's quite a humbling honor to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak with you all today. Um, wow, what an interesting time to be alive today. I think we've heard so much here from this stage. You know, earlier we had the, the panel about strained relations between the US and Europe and how for the first time in recent history, uh, foresight looking forward is, is a little difficult. Rob talked earlier about, about foresight. What is foresight? about being able to prepare for the future, about being able to see forward, connect dots that others cannot necessarily see, to be able to make change, real change in the world. I'd like to offer a couple of thoughts also to contribute uh, to the conversation today in my, in my humble opinion based on some of my experiences. And I wanna start by challenging all of us in the room here today. We do face a lot of daunting challenges in our world. But I can assure you that those, the solutions to those challenges are not going to be created in Washington, D.C., in London, in Paris, in Brussels. The solutions to these challenges are going to come from entrepreneurial, visionary leaders of foresight. And one of the things I want to talk to you about today is everyone here in this room has the ability to be able to affect regional, national, and yes, even global change. But I think the key to that is first slowing down our lives, using catalytic moments that we experience in our day-to-day -day walks, in our day-to-day -day journey, and capture key insights, put those insights together to be able to connect the dots that others can't see and lead. And so I'd like to talk to you about my own personal journey. One humble example of how one person can take a catalytic, sometimes traumatic moment in their lives, gain insights from that moment, and affect potentially truly global change. And trust me, if I can do it, anybody in this room can do it. So in my former job, I was a platoon commander in the infantry and special operations in the Marine Corps. And my story starts in April of 2003, when I found myself in a fighting hole facing north along Highway 7, the main avenue of approach for American forces during the early days of the Iraq invasion. Now we had just survived the first major contact in the war in a place called Nasiriyah, where we'd been ambushed. And we started taking heavy casualties. We were able to fight through this battle to be able to set up a defensive perimeter north of the city. We had to dig in and stop because we'd outrun our supplies and none of us needed about two or three days. 
my men and I were tired and we were hungry. Southern Iraq at the time was one of the poorest places in the world. Saddam had been oppressing the Shia population in the south, as many of you will probably remember. There was a terrible food security problem. There was no access to health care education for the kids. And what had been happening as we moved through the south was the regular Iraqi army was retreating to make a final stand in Baghdad. And Saddam was pushing his Fedayeen soldiers, his special forces soldiers south. And they were going hut to hut in these rural villages, coercing these poor farmers to fight us. Essentially saying, look, you're, you know, your children are starving right in front of you. If you pick up this weapon and go fight these guys 10 miles south of here, we'll drop off a bag of rice here every couple of weeks. And we were fighting these guys by the hundreds and thousands during the early days of the war. And that kind of set the stage for what happened in this one particular morning, this catalytic moment that changed my life forever. So we were dug in, and I remember it was about 5 o'clock in the morning, there was a thick fog. I knew as the sun came up, they were going to start shooting at us again. So I got up out of my fighting hole and started walking the lines to check on my guys. And I looked up on the highway and I saw this small white car approaching our position rapidly from the north. So the enemy had just started using suicide bombing tactics where they pack explosives in the car and blow themselves up. So I thought they were going to run into our position to try to destroy our position. I grabbed three of my guys and we took off running to stop this car. Finally, the car stopped about 50 meters out. The driver hops out, starts waving his arms frantically and running at me. So now I think, okay, this guy has dropped a bomb himself. He's going to blow himself up. So I'm yelling at him in Arabic to get on the ground. He's not listening. And as I lift my weapon, thinking I have to take this guy out, I look behind him, and I see a large black military truck roll up behind his little white car. Six guys in black jump out of the truck, run up to the car, and start shooting into the car. This man stopped dead in his tracks, starts screaming, turns around, and starts sprinting back to the car. And that's when I realized what was happening. See, this guy was one of those poor farmers who was trying to escape across our lines of safety with his family because he didn't want to fight. So I yelled at my guys to take out the, the Fedayeen, and I, I ran as fast as I could to try to save this guy's family. But by the time I got there, it was, uh, it was too late. <clears throat> I looked in the uh, pastor's side. His wife had been shot multiple times in the face. She'd been shot in the chest. She was slumped over dead. He had a... Uh, infant baby girl in the back whose arm had been shot off and she was shot in the head and um, he was cradling the body of his little five or six year old daughter who was shot in the stomach and she was choking on her own blood as she was gasping for air in a matter of two seconds this man lost everything he had in this world and I've seen a lot of horrible things in combat before that and after that, but I've never seen something so unjust. And for the first time in the war, everything slowed down for me, and I put myself in this man's shoes. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I live in a world of choices. Where do I want my kids to grow up? Where, what do I want them to eat for breakfast? What were this man's choices when he woke up this morning? He could watch his kids starve to death. He could strap a bond on himself. He can make some disparate attempt to cross on. He had nothing. And I got really, really angry. In that moment, I had an awakening. I had a key critical insight that forever shaped me after that. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair that the GPS coordinates of a person's dic uh, uh, birthplace dictated what choices they have in this world. And that was the beginning of a powerful conversation among the guys and I in my unit. And over the next two years of combat, we began to see what we believe to be a critical gap in our national security strategy. You see, there's evil people in this world, and we need our armed forces, our military, to be able to, to take care of that problem. But these violent extremist groups thrive and grow by preying on the vulnerable populations in desperate extreme poverty who have no other choices. We saw these violent extremist groups out in these vulnerable populations, and they were doing aid work. They were dropping off food, they were building schools, they were building clinics. And yes, they were horribly oppressive, but honestly, it's the only options that a lot of these families had. Think about it, what would you do? What would you do if it was your child starving in front of you every single day, dying in front of you? 
So we saw this critical gap. I mean, they had, they had guys like us, operators out there, trying to make a difference. We were trying to do good in these villages. But you, but you know what? We were trained to take out targets. We're not trained to help farmers increase crop yields. And they had well-intentioned aid workers there, too, trying to make a difference. But many of the programs were very short-term, handout-based solutions. It was humanitarian aid. It was not long-term economic development that provided real lasting choices. And beyond that, because of the security environment, there was always the threat of kidnapping or death for these brave aid workers. So we began to think in my unit, what if we could build a hybrid? What if we could take the best from the international development community and work with local leaders to design highly effective long-term economic development solutions in agriculture, financial inclusion, health, education, solving some of the critical challenges making their communities so vulnerable to the call of violent extremism. And what if we could staff these models with former operators like myself who know how to handle ourselves in chaotic, violent environments? So I took this idea, and after I got out of the Marine Corps, I enrolled at the Stanford Graduate School of Business to build a company to step into what we saw was a critical gap in our national security strategy. And a pretty amazing thing happened there. Over 30 of my classmates got involved, helped me build out pieces of the model. I had six faculty members come on board, provided seed funding, mentorship, and advice. And one of my mentors there said, look, I know you want to be in these crazy conflict places, but this is a new approach. You need to test it first in a relatively stable place that's, that demonstrates extreme need and desperation and tendencies toward violent extremism. So that led me in uh, June of 2008. I graduated in, in September of 2008. That same year, I moved to one of the remote areas in southwest Kenya to launch the pilot project of what became known as Nuru International, a radical new approach to empowering local leaders to solve their own problems with long-term economic development, providing lasting, meaningful choices as alternatives to supporting the growth of violent extremist groups. Now, as we heard this morning, uh, you know, being a leader is lonely. Being a leader that is effective for change means taking risks. And it also means failing. We heard about Charles Babbage, who's failed many times. So I was like every other entrepreneur had failed many times. My first week on the ground in Kenya, you know, here I am, this, I think I'm this smart guy coming from Stanford Business School. I'm going to solve everybody's problems. I go in there, and, and I, I went into the villages with my... Kenyan counterpart, a guy named Philip Mahochi, who was my partner. We started interviewing some of the local villagers. And within that first week, I got attacked by thieves. I got attacked by black widow spiders, safari ants. We had an earthquake. Um, I got malaria. And then on the last day of the week, which happened to be my birthday, I got struck by lightning. <laughs> you can't make this up. And I thought to myself, you know, I, it's not a good week. <laughs> and I had never quit anything in my life. Here I think I am this badass, uh, excuse me for my language, uh, op operator coming from Stanford. And I was, I was reduced to a weak, helpless individual, you know, surrounded by people I didn't know in an, in an environment I was totally clueless about. So I went over to Philip, my counterpart, and I said, Philip, uh, Listen, I, I, told, I know I told you I was going to come here. We were going to do this together. We are going to transform this region. But look, somebody does not want me to be here. And I am not cut out for this work. I had a really bad week. And uh, so Philip looked at me and he said, Hey, look, before you go home, I want you to think about something. I want you to remember those women that we talked to this week. You had a bad week this week. And you know what? They, they did too. They had a bad week too. You got malaria. You got medicine. And you got better. Their kids... Several of them died this week because they couldn't afford the medicine or they couldn't afford the transportation to the clinic. They had a bad week this week too. You know what, they had a bad week last week because they could only put one meal on the table for their kids, it was a week porridge. They had a bad week the week before that and the week before that and the week before that. You had one bad week. These folks have a bad week every week. But if you stay here, we can work together and transform this region and work with the local leaders so these folks never have a bad week ever again. I mean, how do you say no to that? So I stayed. And thankfully, despite all my mistakes and weaknesses, over the next seven and a half years, I lived in, in villages in Kenya and then in the southern mountains in Ethiopia, and we began to transform these regions. We've uh, empowered over 100,000 people permanently out of extreme poverty through the programs that we initiated. We grew to become a global team of over 300 Americans, Kenyans, and Ethiopians leading this initiative. 
transforming the regions and these communities so they're strong and resilient and they're sustainable and they're standing on their own, independent of Western influence at this point. But you know, that's not, I'm, I'm really proud of my team. I'm proud of, of, of the way they have led through this, proud, proud, proud of the local leaders that we work with. But that's not what really gets me excited. What really gets me excited is where we're going. So in 2015, after the model was working in Kenya and Ethiopia, I got invited to come back to the States by President Bush and President Clinton to be part of the inaugural Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, taking new ideas that, were, that had the potential to make a global impact and really helping them scale up these initiatives. So my project was to take Nuru's approach and introduce it into a volatile conflict zone to directly disrupt one of the worst violent extremist groups that our world faces today. Through those contacts, I got invited to, uh, with, uh, to the Obama administration White House to speak with the senior counterterrorism director. She asked us to take a look at Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, and a group called ADF, which is an Al-Qaeda group in Eastern DRC. So after our initial site surveys, we all decided to, to, to land on Boko Haram because Boko Haram is the most violent, most deadly violent extremist group in our world today. And the, and the front against the war against violent extremism is moving more and more to the African subcontinent. So in November, I took my team there. We did our, our, um, our base needs assessment far in northeastern Nigeria where other, other NGOs cannot operate. And we're gonna be launching our pilot project this year. But this is not about Boko Haram. This is not about northeastern Nigeria. We are trying to change the conversation in our national security. We're trying to promote this concept that proactive development must be a critical component, hand in hand with military intervention if we're ever gonna beat the scourge of violent extremism in our world today. Even right now. <laughs> Last week I was on Capitol Hill. We're, we're winning champions in the Senate and the House on both sides of the aisle. This is a bipartisan issue. Okay, and it's also not just about American security. This is about global security. You know, we talked this morning about this concept of America leading because out of self-interest, out of our own interest. I think we've lost our way. America must lead in our world today. We must become a global citizen, and we must lead through our core values. And I always get choked up thinking about that. That's what I thought for. So I want to leave you with one of my favorite uh, quotes today uh, by Teddy Roosevelt. It's not the critic that counts. It's not the man who points out where the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and falls short again because there is not effort without error and shortcoming, who does actually strive to do the deed, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who in the end at best knows the triumph of high achievement, and at worst, if he fails, if we fail, well, at least our place will never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I want to challenge us today. Let's step together into the arena. Ask yourself in your life, what are those catalytic moments happening to you right now? What are the insights you can garner from those moments? that will help you connect dots others cannot see so together we can create truly systemic change in our world today. Thank you.